Chapter 4, Part 2 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer. Translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 4, Part 2 The Earliest Fictitious Lives of Jesus. Venturini's non-supernatural history of the great prophet of Nazareth is related to Bart's work as the finished picture to the sketch. Karl Heinrich Venturini was born at Brunswick in 1768. On the completion of his theological studies, he vainly endeavored to secure a post as docent in the theological faculty at Helmstadt, or as librarian at Wolfenbüttel. His life was blameless, and his personal piety beyond reproach, but he was considered to be too free in his ideas. The Duke of Brunswick was personally well disposed towards him, but did not venture to give him a post on the teaching staff in face of the opposition of the consistories. He was reduced to earning a bare pittance of literary work, and finally, in 1806, was thankful to accept a small living in Hordorf near Brunswick, he then abandoned theological writing and devoted his energies to recording the events of contemporary history, of which he published a yearly chronicle, a proceeding which, under the Napoleonic regime, was not always unattended with risk, as he more than once had occasion to experience. He continued this undertaking until 1841. In 1849, death released him from his tasks. Venturini's fundamental assumption is that it was impossible, even for the noblest spirit of mankind, to make himself understood by the Judaism of his time except by clothing his spiritual teaching in a sensuous garb, calculated to please the Oriental imagination, Quote, and in general, by bringing his higher spiritual world into such relations with the lower sensuous world, of those whom he wished to teach as was necessary to the accomplishment of his aims. Quote, God's messenger was morally bound to perform miracles for the Jews. These miracles had an ethical purpose, and were especially designed to counteract the impression made by the supposed miracles of the deceivers of the people, and thus to hasten the overthrow of the kingdom of Satan. Close quote. For modern medical science, the miracles are not miraculous. He never healed without mendicants, and always carried his portable medicine chest with him. In the case of the Syrophoenician woman's daughter, for example, we can still detect in the narrative a hint of the actual course of events. The mother explains the case to Jesus. After inquiring where her dwelling was, he made a sign to John, and continued to hold her in conversation. The disciple went to the daughter and gave her a sedative, and when the mother returned, she found her child cured. The raisings from the dead were cases of coma. The nature miracles were due to a profound acquaintance with the powers of nature and the order of her processes. They involve foreknowledge rather than control. Many miracle stories rest on obvious misunderstandings. Nothing could be simpler than the explanation of the miracle at Cana. Jesus had brought with him as a wedding gift some jars of good wine and had put them aside in another room. When the wine was finished and his mother became anxious, he still allowed the guests to wait a little, as the stone vessels for purification had not yet been filled with water. When that had been done, he ordered the servants to pour out some of his wine, but to tell no one whence it came. When John, as an old man, wrote his gospel, he got all this rather mixed up had not indeed observed it very closely at the time. Had perhaps been the least thing Mary himself, says Venturini, and had believed in the miracle with the rest. Perhaps, too, he had not ventured to ask Jesus for an explanation, for he had only become his disciple a few days before. The members of the Essene order had watched over the child Jesus even in Egypt. As he grew older, they took charge of his education along with that of his cousin John and trained them both for their work as deliverers of the people. Whereas the nation as a whole looked to an insurrection as the means of its deliverance, they knew that freedom could only be achieved by means of a spiritual renewal. Once Jesus and John met a band of insurgents, 
Jesus worked on them so powerfully by his fervid speech that they recognized the impiousness of their purpose. One of them sprang towards him and laid down his arms. It was Simon, who afterwards became his disciple. When Jesus was about thirty years old, and, owing to the deep experiences of his inner life, had really far outgrown the aims of the Essene order, he entered upon his office by demanding baptism from John. Just as this was taking place, a thunderstorm broke, and a dove, frightened by the lightning, fluttered round the head of Jesus. Both Jesus and John took this as a sign that the hour appointed by God had come. The temptations in the wilderness, and upon the pinnacle of the temple, were due to the machinations of the Pharisee Zadok, who pretended to enter into the plans of Jesus and feigned admiration for him, in order the more surely to entrap him. It was Zadok, too, who stirred up opposition to him in the Sanhedrin. But Jesus did not succeed in destroying the old messianic belief with its earthly aims. The hatred of the leading circles against him grew, although he avoided everything that could offend their prejudices. It was for this reason that he even forbade his disciples to preach the gospel beyond the borders of Jewish territory. He paid the temple tax also, although he had no fixed abode. When the collector went to Peter about it, the following dialogue took place. Tax collector, drawing Peter aside. Tell me, Simon, does the rabbi pay the die drachma to the temple treasury, or should we not trouble him about it? Peter. Why shouldn't he pay it? Why do you ask? Tax collector. It's been owing from both of you since last Nisan, as our books show. We did not like to remind your master, out of reverence. Peter. I'll tell him at once. He will certainly pay the tax. You need have no fear about that. Tax Collector. That's good. That will put everything straight, and we shall have no trouble over our accounts. Goodbye. When Jesus hears of it, he commands Peter to go and catch a fish, and to take care, in removing the hook, not to tear its mouth, that it may be fit for salting. In that case, it will doubtless be worth a stature. The time arrived when an important move must be made. In full conclave of the secret society, it was resolved that Jesus should go up to Jerusalem and there publicly proclaim himself as the Messiah. Then he was to endeavor to disabuse the people of their earthly messianic expectations. The triumphal entry succeeded. The whole people hailed him with acclamations. But when he tried to substitute for their picture of the Messiah, one of a different character, and spoke of times of severe trial which should come upon all, when he showed himself but seldom in the temple, instead of taking his place at the head of the people, they began to doubt him. Jesus was suddenly arrested and put to death. Here, then, the death is not, as in Bart, a piece of play-acting, stage managed by the secret society. Jesus really expected to die and only to meet his disciples again in the eternal life of the other world. But when he so soon gave up the ghost, Joseph of Arimathea was moved by some vague premonition to hasten at once to Pontius Pilate and make request for his body. He offers the procurator money. Pilate, sternly and emphatically, Dost thou also mistake me? Am I then such an insatiable miser? Still, Thou art a Jew, how could this people do me justice? Know, then, that a Roman can honor true nobility wherever he may find it. He sits down and writes some words on a strip of parchment. Give this to the captain of the guard. Thou shall be permitted to remove the body. I ask nothing for this. It is granted to thee freely. Quote, a tender embrace from his wife rewarded the noble deed of the Roman while Joseph left the praetorium, and with Nicodemus, who was impatiently awaiting him, hastened to Golgotha. Close quote. There he received the body, washed it, anointed it with spices, and laid it on a bed of moss in the rock-hewn grave. From the blood which was still flowing from the wound in his side, he ventured to draw a hopeful augury, and send word to the Essene brethren. They had a hold close by, and promised to watch over the body. In the first four and twenty hours, no movement of life showed itself. 
Then came the earthquake. In the midst of the terrible commotion, a brother, in the white robes of the order, was making his way to the grave by a secret path. When he, illumined by a flash of lightning, suddenly appeared above the grave, and at the same moment the earth shook violently, panic seized the watch, and they fled. In the morning, the brother hears a sound from the grave. Jesus is moving. The whole order hastens to the spot, and Jesus is removed to their lodge. Two brethren remain at the grave. These were the angels whom the women saw later. Jesus, in the dress of a gardener, is afterwards recognized as Mary Magdalene. Later, he comes out at intervals from the hiding place, where he is kept by the brethren, and appears to the disciples. After forty days, he took his leave of them. His strength was exhausted. The farewell scene gave rise to the mistaken impression of his ascension. From the historical point of view, these lives are not such contemptible performances as might be supposed. There is much penetrating observation in them. Bart and Venturini are right in feeling that the connection of events in the life of Jesus has to be discovered. The Gospels give only a series of occurrences, and offer no explanation why they happened just as they did. And if, in making Jesus subservient to the plans of a secret society, they represented him as not acting with perfect freedom, but as showing a certain passivity, this assumption of theirs was to be brilliantly vindicated, a hundred years later, by the eschatological school, which asserts the same remarkable passivity on the part of Jesus, in that he allows his actions to be determined, not indeed by a secret society, but by the eschatological plan of God. Bart and Venturini were the first to see that, of all Jesus's acts, his death was most distinctively his own, because it was by this that he proposed to found the kingdom. Venturini's non-supernatural history of the great prophet of Nazareth may almost be said to be reissued annually down to the present day, for all the fictitious lives go back directly or indirectly to the type which he created. It is plagiarized more freely than any other life of Jesus, although practically unknown by name. End of chapter 4